Appreciate the introduction. It's always good to be um, back in Alabama. I lived in Jackson, Mississippi for uh, 10 years, and Alabama was part of my territory, which ran from the eastern shore of Maryland to Snowflake, Arizona. So uh, I got to know every forestry state uh, between those two places uh, very well. I know where burnt corn is. Been there. Um, oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, when Lee asked me to, to talk to you tonight, um, he asked me to cover the subject that you see here on the screen, and that would be, you know, why are there... Uh, private forest in, in Alabama, and I said, okay, that's what you want to talk about. I think I can think about that and do, do a good job for you. Um, because I thought at the time that it was kind of obvious, you know, why there are private forests in, in uh, Alabama. But the more I thought about it um, and looked around at, at, you know, what's happened to productive forest land, uh, in the United States from uh, literally sea to sign, shining sea, um, you come to the conclusion pretty quick that there's, there's a definite reason why there are private forests in Alabama and why there aren't in some other parts of the country. And I hope to cover that with you tonight. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the things I want to really stress in here, and as a landowner myself, my dad was a timber landowner, grandfather was a timber landowner, um, is that you can have land that you can inherit, but if you can't get the property taxes paid, if you can't get the inheritance tax paid, it's going to go out of your ownership. Uh, I just inherited, uh, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> Last year, 100 acres has been in my mother's family since 1828. Um, so um, all kinds of bad things have happened to that land, uh, including the Yankees. Um, but for some reason, we've been able to hang on to that land for a long, long time. But there's a whole lot of other land throughout the South uh, that you can't say that for. So. You're not going to have private land if you don't have markets. And that's going to be pretty much the theme of my talk here. So from naval stores, uh, you know, which we had a uh, hundred years or so ago, uh, to pellets, which is a big market now, uh, we'll talk about how Alabama forests have responded to change. In order to do that, we're going to use Alabama as an avatar. Now, before that movie came out, I had no clue what this word meant. Um, but I think it means something like that Alabama is a representation of something else. And, and I believe that Alabama is, is a good representation of private forestry, at least in the South, which in my opinion is about the only place left in the United States of America where you can practice private forestry. So, the, uh, <coughs> right here. Um, Alabama forests, uh, they're like a weed. We can't get rid of them, and Lord knows we've tried. All kinds of things that we've done to the land, but the land continues to come back in forest cover. Uh, use all you want because we'll grow more. As long as we have the incentive to grow more. So, the first question you want to ask before you say, you know, why are there private forests in Alabama? Why are there forests here at all? Well, geography and climate, uh, things that we don't have any control over, uh, things that were here a long time before we were and a long time after we'll be gone, are very, very conducive for forest cover, complete forest cover, productive forest cover. We have a long history of conservation. 
and we have a landowner commitment to owning for the long term, not next quarter sell it um, and improve your, your quarterly bottom line or your annual return so you can get a bonus or something like that and move on. Um, that's not what we're about. So um, what keeps forests in Alabama? Well, first of all, you know, you're, you have private forests in Alabama because they are a legacy of statehood. Uh, if you were in the public domain, uh, like Washington State or Montana or Idaho or something like that, that all belonged to the federal government. And they've kept their claws on most of it. But in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, all the original 13 colonies, um, it started off as private land. The people who own it have a strong tie to the land. We have an agrarian, we have a southern culture. And I'm gonna talk a whole lot more about what southern culture means in a minute. We have low property taxes in Alabama. Uh, you cross the Chattahoochee River, that ain't the case, I can tell you. Um, you have favorable government um, and you have strong markets. Now I'm gonna show you this chart twice. Same information, just different colors. Now the Auburn colors are up here right now. <laughs> um, the, uh, the FIA is the Forest Inventory and Analysis Section of the United States Forest Service. And uh, since 1935, throughout the United States, they've been going out uh, every 10 years and measuring each state um, and they've got plots, permanent plots that are out there so they can track what actually is happening on the ground. Now you can track what's happening on the ground now uh, using satellite imagery, aerial photographs, GPS, that kind of stuff. But uh, the only thing we had back in 1935 was aerial photographs and you could look at the cover of the land and pretty much what you would have seen back then what my dad told me when he grew up in South Georgia uh, about a hundred years ago is that you could see a white mule a mile away in the woods. That's how open it was. So we've been measuring, the Forest Service has been measuring forest cover and volume in Alabama since 1935 and that's what has happened. Uh, the blue bars are the, the total acres. Those have increased. Uh, contrary to popular belief in the uh, newspapers and environmental organizations would lead you to believe otherwise. Um, and also the growing stock or how much we're, we're producing per acre has increased because of scientific management. So uh, if you are, if I get it back here, an Alabama fan, the same thing, red, white. Um, but again, a, a remarkable story, and this has been replicated pretty much in every state in the South. Um, and, you know, these are uh, federal figures. It's, uh, it's almost like the, the, the census that we do every 10 years where we count noses of people. Here we're counting the noses of the trees and trying to figure out what the condition of the forest is. And the story for Alabama as well as for the rest of the South is a good story. Okay, so if Alabama is going to be an avatar uh, for the South or representative, um, to understand Southern culture, um, you have to understand that there's a couple of, of things that are unique about us that I don't think that you'll find in the Lake States. I don't think you'll find in New England. Uh, certainly, uh, I don't think you'll find it out West. And the first of those is a sense of place. Uh, the second, uh, love of land. We have a very, very strong respect for private property rights. Uh, and we have this slight sense of Faulknerian gloom about us. I really picked that up a lot in Mississippi. 
Um, so what is sense of place? Well, it's a southern thing. Yankees don't understand this. Just like in the army, we used to say who are, which can mean anything but no. Um, so uh, people understand that. Um, you need to grow up in a place to have an affinity for it, to work it, to live in it, to know it, to love it, and then to leave it to your children. If you don't understand that, you don't have the desire to pass it on. You don't have the desire to leave it in a better condition than you found it. You don't have a desire to inculcate those values in your children. Okay. Um, let me get back here a little bit. Okay. A lot of people think they know about what the South is. And you turn on the television sets, you go to the movie, you're going to get Hollywood's perception of what we are. Um, well, let me tell you what, what I don't think we are. Uh, and I have no apologies to uh, anybody out in Hollywood for this. Uh, we don't have moonlight magnolias. Uh, we don't have any cats on hot tin roofs. We have um, no big, big Daddy or Bubba. Well, you know, maybe we got a few of those. I, I think I saw some coming down today. Uh, definitely, I don't think there's any uh, vampires in Louisiana. Uh, that seems to be a popular TV show today. Uh, no red velvet armadillo grooms cakes. No bologna cakes. And no New York minutes. We just aren't in that much of a hurry. Okay, what is the South? This is my opinion. I think you might agree with me. Okay, it's air conditioned. <laughs> We do speak English. Sometimes we speak it slowly. Uh, we do sometimes have Serbian accents. We'll fry anything. Uh, we are American by birth, Southern by the grace of God. And we do give a damn. The South is home to... Bluegrass, Blue Bonnets, The Blues, Blue Christmas, Jazz, Soul Food, and Elvis is still our king. Okay, so that's kind of sets the background of what the South is and what we believe in. Um, and some of the people that we've had in the South have had a tremendous impact on what we've done from a forest landowner standpoint. Uh, we've had members of the Society of American Foresters, members of the Alabama Forest Owners Association, members of the Georgia Forestry Association, Louisiana Forestry Association, you name it, who have had an impact because they've cared and they've not taking no from an answer when the government tells you you can't do such. Or somebody proposes some bonehead law um, and you say, look, if you pass that law, it may make you feel good, but it's going to wipe out private timber production in the South to do this. So we've had folks like Harley Langdale, who is pictured here, uh, Bill Ottmeyer, and others here in Alabama who founded the um, Forest Farmers Association back in the 1940s. Now Harley uh, doesn't look like that anymore, but he actually still is alive. He's registered forester number three in Georgia. He's 96 years old. He still runs his company, Langdale Forest Products. Uh, last year they made half a billion dollars. Now, what Harley and Mr. Ottmeyer and others from Alabama and other southern states went to Washington back during World War II to tell Congress was, if you expect us to invest in timber to promote the war effort, 
you got to give us a reason to do it. And they lobbied and they got capital gains tax treatment for timber so that when you sell your timber, you don't have to pay it at ordinary income rates. You pay it at the capital gains rate, which is lower, which is an incentive. They also talked to the federal banking regulators to be able, so the, the federal banking rules at that time would not let a bank that had a federal charter loan money on Timberland. And Harley always says that um, when a Timberland owner came into the bank, the first thing the banker would do was look at his cuffs of his pants. And if he had sawdust in his cuffs, he was automatically disqualified from getting a loan. Because they said, well, gee, you know, we might know what the underlying value of the dirt is, but we don't have any idea what the value of the timber is. We don't know anything about the market. So they got that rule changed. That led to the development of new markets and a growing timber supply. Markets are fundamental to jobs. They are fundamental to conservation. Um, I believe that, that forest products drive the land. Um, so without products, or as the MBA types will say, uh, added value, uh, there is little economic incentive for us to manage the land. Now we have a whole lot of other reasons why we might want to do it, but if we're like the state of Alabama, or if we're like the state of Georgia, and we're broke, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. So whether it's turpentine or pellets, you have to give the private sector a market. Uh, the South's economy has gone from naval stores to ship's timbers to saw timber to pulp wood uh, to panels to engineered wood and now to energy stock and other people call it biomass. We've had a long, long history in the South of exporting. Um, trade is in our blood. We have a tradition steeped in exporting forest products. The colonial practice of exporting uh, ships timbers, live oak, long leaf for masts, naval stores, tobacco deer hides, indigo cotton, all these things came from forest lands. We became entrenched in trade at a very early stage, even before we were a country, uh, with the Brits, the Spanish, the French, the Dutch, and others. And as trade demand changed, so did the southern forest change to meet demand. Forest management um, is driven by a lot of things. And I have to qualify this first one, absent government interference. I believe that land ownership will gravitate to the best manager. Now, it's hard to keep the government out, uh, but if, you, if they leave us alone, then the land will be owned by the people who will manage it the best. Uh, in the South, that has always been the private sector. Um, recently, we've seen a, a huge change uh, in private ownership from cutover tracks, uh, hundred years ago, back in the 30s, uh, as the bow weevil came through, uh, to an integrated forest products company of uh, firms which rose up from them, uh, to large investors who are now buying uh, timberland, both uh, domestic and foreign. In the last 15 years, we've seen 40 million acres of industrial timberland in the South be sold. Um, the last true uh, forest products company, uh, Warehouser. Um, sometime this month, if it hasn't already happened, will become a real estate investment trust. They will no longer be a traditional uh, vertically integrated forest products company. So they will be the last one uh, standing uh, in the United States. And so they may have already made the reconversion, just depends on when they file a tax return. That's the same thing, or, or very, very similar um, 
to what happened back in the Depression in the Dust Bowl when we saw 60 million acres change hands. As people left the land because they couldn't pay the property taxes because it wouldn't produce and they went off somewhere else and that land was sold on the courthouse steps to somebody else. You know, from that time until the present, we haven't seen that kind of a land ownership change that we have seen um, in the last 15 years. We do have a culture here in the South of um, timber growing. Uh, from Jamestown and Williamsburg uh, to, the, to the present, we have always uh, exported internationally. Uh, this is a picture in uh, historic um, Jamestown where they're actually using what's called a pit saw, um, a long crosscut saw to uh, uh, saw up uh, a can into some boards. Um, our supply chain has adapted to our culture and to our logistics system. Uh, the U.S in particular the South uh, model is that when somebody dies, the timber's gonna get sold. So the underlying manager man, uh, message here to uh, procurement guys in the room, read the obituaries, because uh, there's gonna be some timber available. We also have a long history of minimal government control, minimal government interference. Uh, we have non-regulatory BMPs for the most part. Uh, only two states have mandatory reforestation laws, and those are only seed tree laws. Uh, we do have a respect for private property rights. Uh, I'm not sure what the law uh, is uh, in Alabama, Madam Prosecutor, but in Georgia, uh, you can go on to your neighbor's land to get your horse, but you can't go on his land without permission to get a dog. So um, there's, there's got to be some arcane legal reason behind that, but um, private property rights are very, very strong here in Alabama as well as the rest of the South, and that is what makes us special. If you want to contrast that to the Swedish model where the land ownership pattern is almost identical to what it is in Alabama, um, Taxes are usually too high for them to sell the forest land. You generally have to deal with landowner associations to be able to sell your wood. Uh, you're not able to do it one-on-one -on -one like you are. Um, you can recreate on it all you want, but so can everybody else. No land in Sweden is posted. Anybody can come on your land at any time to camp, to hike, uh, to pick uh, mushrooms and berries, which they have a lot of, uh, to take pictures. Now, they can't build fires, they can't hunt fish on your land, but they can walk all over it. Um, now, that would be a liability nightmare here in the United States, but over there, apparently it isn't. But uh, things are very, very different there than they are here, even though the, uh, the landowner types and how much they own is almost identical to the way it is here in Alabama. So we're at the 21st century juncture now. Uh, the economy stinks, the dollar's worse. Uh, housing and wood are flat. Uh, pulp wood is uh, competitive and uh, most of the experts are saying that salt timber will rebound. It is a fabulous time to export. Uh, yet our own government uh, seems to be against us with all the different uh, regulations that they seem to be trying to impose on us now from trying to tell us what wood qualifies as biomass and what wood doesn't qualify as biomass. And so if you've got a natural stand on one side of the road, the planted stand on one side, on the other side of the road, under one of the laws, the plantation doesn't qualify, the natural stand does, it's the same wood right across the dirt road, uh, but you, couldn't, you would not be able to sell it um, uh, as biomass and get credit for being green. Um, pulp wood makes great pellets. That's a, uh, an issue that we're dealing with all throughout the South now. Uh, paper mills have always uh, used pulp wood size wood to make paper. 
pulp, uh, but it also, that same type of wood, not very big, uh, also makes great pellets. So, you know, who's going to win the competitive battle there uh, yet is yet to be seen. Um, electric utilities are starting to get into the markets now. Uh, and what they like um, is very, very long-term contracts with suppliers of their fuel. There's a long-term history in the South of short-term contracts. Um, not long-term. Um, and then timber contracts are based on free market control. So if the uh, utilities want to really tap into this um, uh, wood biomass market, um, then either they're going to have to adapt or we're going to have to adapt. And like one of my colleagues, Tom Harris, at the University of Georgia says that this situation is kind of like California and pot. They don't encourage it, but if you want to smoke pot, that's the place to do it. So um, the South doesn't, from our culture, encourage long-term contracts, but if you want to do it, we're ready to deal with you. Finally, uh, the South is also a great place to invest and disinvest um, in forest land. And I want to leave you with this picture which was taken by one of my students, uh, Jason Kinsey, on Westerville land here in Alabama. And um, the story that I'll tell here is about Tom Glass. Many of you may have known Tom. He worked for MacDillon Bloedel uh, here in Alabama. And um, one time he won a, a, an award from the Society of American Foresters um, at their annual meeting. And uh, I can't remember exactly where it was. It was somewhere here in the South. And I was there, and I, and I knew Tom very well, and, and uh, listened to him give his acceptance speech. And he talked about what it meant to him to be a forester. And Tom said that he was, almost every day, he'd ride past this house on the side of the road that was, uh, and you've seen them, uh, unpainted, uh, no grass in the yard, um, but right out front was a beautiful rose garden. And he rode by, you know, many, many times and he thought about it and he said, you know, this guy's living in a house that's not painted and um, he's not keeping his yard up, but he's got these beautiful roses. So one day he, had, he said, I'm going to find out, you know, what his motivation is. And so he stopped, and he went up on the front porch, knocked on the door. The man came out, invited him to sit down. They had some sweet tea, and Tom told him the story about why he was there and who he was. And he said, I'm so interested to learn why um, you put so much effort into these roses. And he said, well, it's real easy because those roses are my glory. And so here in Alabama, I know, and in other parts of the South, the forests are our glory. Thank you very much. Thank you.